So a few weeks ago, I put a poll up and asked if people wanted to see a definitive guide on how to turn a pen. Not enough of you voted no, so unfortunately you're stuck with this, the definitive guide on making a pen. The Wood Knight is sponsored by I Would Like. So you might have noticed that I said making a pen, not turning a pen. Well, we will be using the lathe for this. The majority of the work isn't actually done at the lathe. There is actually very little turning involved. However, it is a great first project for someone getting interested in turning, uh, interested in how to use a lathe, and the skills learnt from making a pen transfer to a whole variety of craft projects that are done at the lathe. Pens come in a variety of sizes, shapes, materials, but we're going to look at a variation on the most common type, the slimline, or in this case, the streamline. So this is a finished pen, this one happens to be in Tassioak. This is a streamline kit, and the kit refers to the hardware here that you see. So in this particular case, we've got uh, a copper plating. All pens will come in a kit form. As I said, some of them are different, so this one happens to be a single barrel, whereas this has two barrels. The wood gets glued onto these uh, brass tubes, and then all the components, once you've turned it, will get pressed in. So our first step is to attach the wood to these brass tubes. So I mentioned that we've got to get these brass tubes into our pen blank. If you have a different pen kit than what we're looking at today, your pen may require a little bit thicker blank to start off with to get the requisite diameter for the hardware. Uh, that'll make a little bit more sense later on. We've got two brass tubes to put into there, and while we could drill all the way through, most drill presses are not going to have the 150mm uh, or so uh, quill travel that this pen blank is. So we need to chop it into more manageable lengths to put the two tubes into. So we need, we've need we got these two tubes to put into the wood uh, and it's best to have a little bit of wriggle room on either side in case we get some blowout on the drill press or whatever. However, we don't want to have to turn off all this material here. So grab your pen tube. Give yourself maybe five mil extra on either side up to 5mm I should say. So long as you've got a little bit extra there's no real right or wrong. Now the other nice thing with pens is to get a nice grain match all the way along. So we need to cut down this line but on this line here tells us how those two pen blanks will go together. You can use just about any cutting implement to cut a pen blank. These aren't overly large um, so you certainly could use a bandsaw, table saw, miter saw However, my preference is usually just a handsaw as they're quite small and it goes quite quickly. The cuts don't have to be super straight or accurate or smooth or whatever. They're not really our reference surfaces. The next step is to find the center marks for our pen blanks. This isn't strictly necessary, but it does make drilling the blank a lot easier. Now realistically there are two ways to drill out a pen blank. First is at a drill press with a pen vise like this. The second is at the lathe itself, but that requires a four jaw chuck, a special pair of jaws, and a Jacob's chuck for the tail stop. Now these are all items that while you're going down the path of turning you'll probably pick up, but they're not necessarily something a beginner will have. A drill press is much more likely. Can you freehand it? Well, if you've got a significantly large enough blank that you can recover from any alignment issues that you can uh, put into the blank, yes, but generally it's a little bit safer to do it on a drill press. So this vise has two uh, centering jaws and a little V-notch in it. You don't strictly need a pen vise. Uh, you could certainly make up a jig using uh, parallel clamps. Sorry hand through parallel clamps. If you're just getting into it, it's a little difficult often to know what a good result is. Um, something like this will give you a much better result nearly every single time. So for this pen kit and slim lines, the two most popular pen kits, um, we're gonna use a seven millimeter drill bit. That seven millimeters corresponds with the outside diameter of the tubes that we're gonna insert. If you've got a different pen that uses a larger diameter tube, you're going to use a larger drill bit. This is where our center point, or marking our center point before, is nice, though not needed, because it makes it very easy to make sure that our drill press is lined up with our vise, 
and we can see there that it's going to hit our center point quite well. With the pen blanks cut and drilled, it's time to glue in the tubes. Before we do, there are two ways in which people typically glue in these tubes. One is with five minute epoxy, and the other is with CA or super glue. I've only used CA, I haven't used five minute epoxy, uh, and I've had great success so long as I scuff up the tube. The tubes will typically come with a very thin coat of lacquer, uh, over top of them which will stop the tubes from tarnishing. However, if you put the super glue on that, you don't always get the best bond. So I've got a little bit of 80 grit sandpaper. So just wrap around the tube, turn the tube. All right, so I'm gonna use some thick CA. Uh, don't use thin CA because the thin viscosity glue could go into the grain too much and not actually create a bond between the metal and the wood, but just sort of firm up the wood. Again, this is another not required, but is a nicety. It's a tube insertion tool. It's very scientific. Put the tube on the end, put glue on it, put it in the pen blank. You can certainly make your own one out of dowel, or you can just be careful and use your fingers to put the glue and tube into the pen blank. Medium CA will be just fine for this as well, but I like to use thick couple of beads of glue. We want to work it around on one end, pull that out and go in through the other end. Now this again isn't strictly required, but I found some great success with this. I want to make sure that the brass tube is just below the surface on one end and making sure it's not poking out the other. Now the side with our line is where we want the tube to be closest to because those two sides will be reassembled later on. While cyanoacrylate or CA glue can be accelerated with an accelerator, it's not recommended to do that. It will weaken the strength of the bond. And while that's fine for a finish, and we'll get into that more later, uh, on the tubes like this, you really don't want it to be weaker than it has to be. I typically will leave these two to three hours and then they're good to go. Um, if you opt to go for five minute epoxy, just remember that the five minute epoxy means that it's got a five minute pot life, not that it's cured completely in five minutes. All right, so our pen blanks are good and proper dry. Uh, we just need to clean it up so that we can get the mandrel nice and square with the pen blank. We don't want it on any sort of angle. The way that you do that is with a tool called a pen end mill. Sometimes it'll be referred to as a reamer. Uh, it'll have a long shaft for cleaning out the tube. So any glue that's got on the inside, this can help clean out. Uh, this will match the inside diameter of your pen blank. So in this case, it's gonna be less than seven millimeters. This also has a series of teeth on the outside, which will be used to flush up the pen blank. So cutting that end grain, so that it's flush with the brass tube and a shank for attaching it to a drill. Now there's probably two ways you can do this, three ways you can do this. You can put it back in your pen vise and do it at the drill press and that's just fine. You can use a cordless drill, which is what I tend to use. Uh, and depending on the blank, you can either hold it in your hand or put it in a woodworking vise and drill it that way. I find for softer woods like tassie oak, maple, walnut, that sort of thing, uh, it's easy enough just to do it by hand, holding it. Um, but for denser woods, so jarra, red gum, uh, anything that's been cast with epoxy, probably want to put it in a vise uh, or at the drill press because they can be a little bit difficult. So this is a closer look at what the pen mill looks like. And there's typically two types that you'll find. This one is specifically for seven millimeter uh, pens, so slimlines, streamlines, that sort of thing. It has four cutters on it. Uh, these are generally cheap and cheerful. The other sort is like this, which will typically have six cutters on it uh, and a whole bunch of replaceable shafts, depending on the size of the uh, pen that you're doing. So some pens will have bigger tubes, so they need a bigger shaft than the seven millimeter ones. So as I said, I typically mount this in a drill. You can see one I've already done here. The brass is exposed at both ends so that we're 
the bushings are pushing up against that rather than the wood and not skewing registration or anything like that. Also means that when we turn it, we're turning down to the final dimensions of the pen rather than having to then square up the ends. So you want to stop and check it fairly frequently and <clears throat> just as well I did stop then because we're right at the price then. One final tip that you may not see many people know about or even recommend is deburring the brass tubes. When you're using a reamer or an end mill, whatever you want to call it, the cutting process can create a burr on the inside of the brass tube. Now for slimline pens where the bushings just butt up against it, it's not too much of an issue. But when you go to press everything in, you can be often fighting additional friction and it can make it difficult to line everything up. <coughs> the burring tool like this is meant for deburring pipes and other metal products. Um, you won't find it in turning stores typically, uh, but a lot of hardware stores sell them for under $15, that sort of thing. So we take our deburring tool and we put it inside the tube and then just run it along like that. And it creates a taper on the inside of the tube, which just makes it easier for inserting everything. Just before we get started turning, we better go over some basic terminology for the lathe. This is our headstock here, and just out of frame here is our tailstock. This is our banjo, and this is the tool rest. In the headstock, you'll place a pen mandrel. There are typically two types available, an adjustable pen mandrel and a non-adjustable pen mandrel with the adjustable type being a little bit more expensive. It's probably worth getting, uh, though it is not needed. The pen mandrel will have a Moore's taper and, and typically this is going to be an MT2 or a Moore's taper 2. Uh, that means that, that's just the size of the taper and 99% of new lathes will have a MT2 in the headstock and in the tailstock. That just gets fitted in with friction and the same goes for in the tailstock. Now, depend, there's a few options here. You can go for what is called a mandrel saver, and I would actually recommend these. They do make it a lot easier to turn pins, and you don't have to worry so much about pressure. So that just goes in the tailstock. Now, alternatively, there are other types of uh, centers that you can use for the tailstock, such as this rotating uh, 60 degree center, uh, and that would then butt up against the end of the mandrel there. The mandrel saver type has a hollow, so it actually goes all the way through and the uh, pen mandrel, sorry, the tailstock is hollow so the pen mandrel goes through that as well. Now to get the pen onto the mandrel, well in this case we can just slide it on and it fits just fine. A lot of the other pen kits will have different sizes of the tube, so they'll be a larger tube, which means that you need to use uh, bushings that go inside that tube that'll then sit around this, around the mandrel. In the case of slim lines and streamlines, the bushings just slide on. I'm actually going to put a couple of spaces on just so it's a little bit easier. So we've got two spaces, the first bushing, first part of the pin, the central bushing, second part of the pen and you'll notice that we're lining up the two lines to indicate the middle point. The last bushing, another spacer. And then we can snug up our tail stock, advance the quill to apply some pressure, lock that down, put our tool rest into position and we're just about ready to turn. Now those bushings are where we're turning down to. So they are important both to keep the pen blank from moving around as we're turning and to give us a guidance for what diameter needs to be where to match up with the hardware. Now one of the secrets to pen turning is that you need to have the speed up on maximum. In general with turning you should have the speed up whatever the fastest speed is that is safe. Now in the case of big bowls, something that's off centre and still rough, uh, you'll go slower and slower until the lathe vibrates less. 
In case of pens, they're fairly safe to turn. It's not a lot of material and the faster you go, any uh, eccentricity from the lathe will generally be counteracted by the high RPMs. The other secret is that you can use basically any tool. Now you can certainly use a roughing tool to get these round and then switch to a spindle gouge. I like to use a bowl gouge, so that's what I'm gonna use. Uh, other tools include a skew, which is probably my preference, but uh, I haven't used for a while, so I'm a little rusty. So we're gonna start by rounding the blanks. You don't wanna to take too aggressive a cut as you will get splintering, though that is dependent on the timber and this is a particularly splintery timber. If you do get into turning, this is a fairly common type of um, sandpaper that you can buy. It's a bunch of small strips of sandpaper on rolls. Um, and it actually works out fairly economical. So these will typically start at 150 grit um, and work their way up to 600 grit. You only need a small bit of sandpaper per pen. But if you are doing multiple pens, don't be tempted to reuse it if they are different timbers because you don't want color contamination. Now there tends to be two schools of thought on sanding at the lathe, particularly for spindles. The first is at very high RPMs with a very light pressure and the other is at very low RPMs with probably a little bit more pressure. I will let you decide what you think is the best for you. Do some experimenting, maybe not on a pen but on a general spindle, see what you like. I tend to like high speed, low pressure and between each grit, I then go with the grain. Now if we take a look at that, we are pretty smooth. We've got rid of most of the tool marks. There's just a couple at this end, so we'll go back. Then as the grain on the pen is going that way, rather than that way, uh, you'll have a lot of scratches going with it, go and crush the grain, sorry, so I like to rotate by hand. If your lathe doesn't have a handle at the headstock, you can grab here. Then we move on to our next grit, and so on and so forth, up to 600 grit. So we send it up to 600 grit, the pen is nice and smooth, um, it's been cleaned down, and this is where we need to sort of diverge depending on what we are going to choose for finishes. Now, in my mind, there are three main finishes for pen turning. The first is friction polish. So something like shallow wax. Not sure which way up this is gonna be. Uh, and you apply that straight to the pen uh, with a rag while the lathe is running. You do that three or four times and you're done. It'll take about five to 10 minutes to apply. And it creates one of the best feeling finishes, though it has one major downside and that's that it's not particularly durable. The next type of finish to talk about is CA or cyanoacrylate or superglue. This is a CA pen. It's got a very high gloss. The pen itself then becomes waterproof and it's very durable. Now this is a technique that is probably recommended, but it does have quite a steep learning curve because CA is kind of fickle. Once you learn it, it is a great technique and you can batch out a pen about the same time that you can do the shallow wax finish, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but the important thing is you can go from start to finish on a pen in about an hour. The final form of finish is what's on this pen, which happens to be polyurethane. Now, not many people will talk about polyurethane on pens or turned items. It takes a lot longer and most of that time is in drying, but it creates quite a similar finish to CA. They're both high gloss, though the CA is probably a little higher gloss. 
Uh, they're both kind of plasticky finishes, though the polyurethane feels better in hand. It feels a bit warmer and adds a little bit more colour to the pen. Now there are pros and cons to both. Obviously the CA goes on a lot quicker. The polyurethane is probably a little bit more durable in the fact that it isn't as hard, so it's not as brittle. So any movement on the pen in the wood, it's not gonna cause any cracking on the polyurethane, but it might, and I have heard stories of that on the pen, though I've not experienced that. Uh, also, if you drop it, you're more likely to shatter the finish on a CA pen than you are on polyurethane, though, again, that hasn't been an issue for me personally. All right, so we're gonna start with friction polishes first. Friction polishes will typically have a shellac and wax component to it. Uh, we're going to be using Shallow Wax by U Beauty. It's an Australian company, Australian product. Um, but we're not going to use the regular Shallow Wax. We're going to use Shallow Wax Glow, which is my preference. Uh, between the two, this has a little darker, a little richer colour. Um, end of the day, they're pretty similar. I don't think the glow is available outside of Australia. We're also going to be using Triple E Ultra Shine. This is a Tripoli or Rotten Stone suspended in wax. This will turn our 600 grit sanded pen blank into about 12,000 grit, so nice and buffed. Uh, there are other brands available. I think Hut Maker Polish. Some of them are two part, some of them are three part, some are up one part. They're all applied in roughly the same way. Uh, and things like AAA can be used for all of them. So you're gonna need a couple of cotton rags. First one, we're just gonna dip a bit into the AAA. Now it can get pretty hard depending on the t ambient temperature. So if it's a bit too hard to get any out, uh, stick it in some warm water, the whole bottle, and that should make it a bit easier. So we're just going to, with the lathe off, we're rotating the Spindle, rub some into the surface. It's been a while since I've used this, and I used it in summer, so it was a lot more malleable then. It's quite a cold day here. So the next part is to turn on the lathe, and we're basically going to try and rub the uh, AAA off. And in doing so, we're going to abrade the surface and really polish it. You can see this is starting to get quite shiny already, so I'm going to move on to a clean part of the rag. Keep going back and forth, we're applying a fair bit of... Well, we're applying a fair bit of heat. We can get see that this side's getting shinier and shinier. It's now getting bands of light reflecting the fluoros. Now these are almost glassy in touch. They are very, very smooth. So that we're done with the AAA for now. Shake the shallow wax bottle, to make sure it all mixes properly as the solids will tend to settle. So we've got another fresh rag. Now one thing I will say is I hate the bottles that you put this in. They always gum up and they can be very difficult to get the product out. I'm gonna to have to go clean that. All right, so we've got our cotton rag. Just going to put a very small amount onto the rag, then wipe it over the surface of the pen blank. We're not rubbing it in, we're just sort of rubbing it on. Then using that same wet part of the rag, we're going to hold that into the um, pen blank and go to max speed. We're applying a lot of pressure. That pressure creates friction, which cures the shallow wax. I'm applying pressure from both sides of the um, mandrel so that I'm not deflecting it one way or another. And that's done. Now I would typically do three to maybe five coats of shallow wax as it's a very thin finish. Um, and that'll last a lot longer. All right, next up we've got uh, the super glue or CA finish. So I'm not really even sure what brand it is that I'm gonna use. Uh, Milli Lime? I haven't found that the actual brand is all that important. CA tends to come in four different viscosities. You've got thin, medium, thick, and gel. For gluing in tubes, anything but thin is fine, but for the finish, uh, thin or medium is your choice 
Before we get started, there are many different variations on CA finishes. Um, we're going to be using Activator, in this case Instant Mitre Fix Activator. The brand again isn't overly important, they all seem to work about the same with all different CAs. Some people use, I believe it's boiled linseed oil as the catalyst uh, to instantly cure it. Some people just leave it in between, wait for it to dry. Next important thing to note is that we're going to be using some blue paper towel to apply it. Some people use the little plastic bags that the pen comes in. Some people use their gloves directly. Not a big fan of the gloves directly because you can ruin it. Um, I've had the most success with the paper towel and it's important to use something that doesn't contain cotton. Cotton, cotton rags or paper towel with cotton reinforcement will cause an exothermic reaction with the uh, cyanoacrylate glue and that will start smoking. It won't, well, it's unlikely that it'll burst into flames. However, you don't really want the smoke to ruin your finish. So I've cut up about 20 pieces like this and that's enough to do this pen. It was only one square of paper towel. Finally, before we get started, we're going to drop the speed to, uh, in this case, 670 RPM. All right, so in case my fat head gets in the way, the technique is basically to put a couple of drops of CA um, on the pen, spray the activator, and then that's our coat done, and then we can move on. With the thin CA, depending on the viscosity and the finish that you want, you need anywhere between 10 and 20 coats. And that's our first coat done. The paper towel just gets thrown on the floor because the smell is awful. Uh, I'd also strongly advise you to wear safety glasses as CA is awful um, and it can the fumes of it can irritate eyes and obviously if you get anything spraying anywhere you don't want that in your eyes. So I've missed a little bit at the edges here that's okay subsequent coats will fix that up. So our pen is starting to build its finish. The finish is looking not fantastic to be honest. Until you start buffing it, don't worry too much. You just don't want any drips, um, which is why we're applying it while the lathe is on. It's kind of rippled and will adapt to the texture of the towel I've found, but the buffing process takes care of that very easily. All right, so we've applied 10 coats of finish, I think, uh, and now it's time to buff out the surface. Now, I'm not sure how well it's showing up, but as I said, it's got that sort of rippled texture effect and doesn't look fantastic. Now to sand um, the CA, if, if it were to use normal sandpaper, it would gum up, it would burn, it would look pretty rubbish. So the solution is to use Micromesh. Micromesh is a very fine abrasive ranging from 1500 all the way down to 12,000 grit. That's how you get a super shiny finish. These do require some water though. So I've got a little pool of water here. I've got my piece of melamine with the grits labeled on it so that I can protect the bed of the lathe. I'm gonna turn the lathe up to 1500 RPM. So these are foam squishy pads. Hopefully you can see that there. Uh, so it's difficult to apply a lot of pressure so they don't generally burn through the finish. However, if you apply too much pressure for too long, you will get a crappy finish. So already, just in a few seconds, I can see that that is starting to work through that finish. So we want to spend probably the most amount of time with the 1500 to remove the most amount of material. Uh, to smooth it out and then quickly work through our other grits. Mm -hmm. 
And with that, we're done. Uh, you can see, hopefully, that we've got quite a high gloss. It will feel pretty glassy. And it's smooth all the way around. There's no ridges, there's no bumps. So, so the issues with the CA, with the rippling effect, all gone. Uh, and we could take the pen off and press it from here. However, there are a few tricks to getting it uh, even smoother than that. One trick is Brasso, as in the metal pro polish. Brasso is a very, very mild abrasive, so in the order of 30,000 grit or higher, and you can use that to polish the plastic even further. There are other products like Micro Gloss Liquid Abrasive, or even Triple E. Now, I haven't had a lot of success with the Triple E. I found that it's sort of burnt through the finish a little bit more. So I found that Brasso works really, really well. Just pour out a little bit of Brasso onto a rag, and it's safe to use cotton now, just while the CA is uh, liquid. I'm just going to apply that onto my two blanks. I'm going to wait until it gets hazy. Once it has dried and gotten hazy, we can take a clean part of the rag and buff. All right, so visually it might not actually look like there's been any change there, but I can tell you the feel of it is now really like glass. It's so very, very smooth. Before it felt smooth, but there was still that little bit of friction when you're rubbing your hand up and down it. Now that's all gone. So not a necessary step, but it is a nice little touch to get that even more premium quality pen. With the pen turned and finished, uh, it's time to press all the components in. I'm going to use a pen vise. This happens to be a PSI branded one that I picked up from Pop Shed. There are many like it. Uh, basically choose which one you like. You can get away without a pen vise. You can use a wood vise, like a leg vise or a quick action vise. You can use a quick action clamp, so the squeezy type. Uh, but ultimately this sort of vise is quickest, yet gives you the most control for pressing. Now this pen happens to be the CA pen that we did. Uh, and if you've chosen to go with the CA finish, you may want to get some 600 grit sandpaper, put your pen blank down and just slowly rotate to remove any CA from the very ends of the barrels. If there is CA on the ends of the barrel and you press something into it, it can cause it to crack. And at that stage, it is quite unfortunate. It's not the end of the world. You can still knock out the hardware. Uh, and return, refinish, that sort of stuff. But if you can avoid it, I'd recommend doing that. So I've just got a small piece of 600 grit sandpaper. I'm placing it as flat as I can, as straight as I can, I should say, and just gently rotating, removing any finished material from the end of the pen barrel. If you're doing this with the uh, shallow wax or friction polish finishes, you don't need to worry about it. And for polyurethane, I haven't found that's an issue. All right, so I'm going to lay out the components and how they'll be in the final configuration. So we've got our two pen barrels, we've got the nib, we've got the transmission, the center band, the pen refill, and the end cap and clip. Typically, you'll do the nib first, then the transmission. Not all pen types have a transmission, though all that use the cross type do. This uh, is a ballpoint pen rather than a rollerball Pen. Not my personal preference, but everyone has an, their own writing preference. So we're going to start with the main barrel, the writing barrel, I suppose, uh, which in this particular kit, you go nib first into the barrel. So we just position these on the pen vise, like so. Ideally, you want to get even pressure, and that's where this can be a little bit easier than other types. Also, ideally, you'd clamp this down so it doesn't slide on you. And just until that touches. And then that's that portion done there. So next is the transmission, and this needs to be the correct depth because the refill goes in, screws in, and this is what actually will do the projection of the pen writing nib. Might be a little bit hard to see, but there is a brass section and a little divot. We need to press up to that divot, but no more. If you do go too far, there are ways to 
remove the pen parts, but I'm not going to cover that in this particular video. So for this particular pen press, we actually need to remove a couple of these pieces. The spring will hold that in fairly well. There we go. Pressing up to there. That's where other vices can be a little bit tricky to get that, that sort of control. That's why you sort of don't want to use an F clamp, you can apply a bit too much pressure. Now the pen refill goes in and this then screws in. We take our center band that just slides over and we can switch to our end cap or second barrel. Now in this particular vise, it can be a little bit tricky to do these shorter pieces. So there is just a section you can extend out like so. Alternatively, you can get a, another piece of wood and jam it in and that works just fine too. If you were doing a lot of pens at once, that would be the method I would recommend. Then finally, this just slides on with, with hand pressure and we can rotate that. We can check the extension of the writing nib and say that when it's fully retracted, the pen point is not exposed and it is exposed enough when we rotate it all the way out. If it wasn't, we could pull this off, take out the refill and press that in a little bit further. So it's better to be a little bit under and have to push it a little bit further, particularly when you're getting used to it, than to go a little bit over. But generally that line on all kits is what I found is where you need to go to. That is how you make pens. As I said, it's making a pen, not turning a pen, because the vast majority of the time you don't spend on the lathe. However, using a lathe will produce much better results than doing it on a drill press simply because the bearings are designed for that sort of rotational force. Uh, you've got better speed control, that sort of thing. Now you may notice that I did say originally I was gonna do a polyurethane pen as well, and I haven't. However, the polyurethane that I have has gone off, uh, so I need to go get some more iron, I need a little tin. So I will follow this up with another supplementary episode on the polyurethane finish. There'll be several supplementary videos such as how to turn a pen using just a skew chisel, as well as a video on sharpening, specifically sharpening traditional lathe tools, so high-speed steel, carbide tools, and pen mills, as well as a video on acrylics, which, as you can see, I need to get a start on. Now, one thing hopefully you'll take away from this, if you've gotten this far, is that there is no one way to do everything. These are the ways that I have picked up and find work for me and my tooling but there may be ways that you find work better for you. For example, you might find that carbide tools are the way to go for you, or that you don't like bowl gouges and spindle gouges work better for you, or you prefer a different brand of finish or whatever. It doesn't really matter. This is meant to be a good, fairly in-depth guide on all the ins and outs, hopefully a few tips and tricks amongst it, uh, but there are many ways to skin a cat, so to speak, and pen turning is something where you could ask 10 different turners how they make a pen and get 20 different answers. If you've got further questions on how to turn a pen, make sure you leave comments below so that I can follow it up with a supplementary episode, and hopefully we can get a real library of information that goes into excruciating detail on how to turn a pen. Thanks for watching.